Welcome to Strength Roots Podcast, presented by Hyperthrive Athletics, where we dissect the mindsets, stories, habits, and tactics of elite performers. Strength Roots Podcast, the growth starts here. Let's get right into it. So, welcome to the Strength Roots Podcast. Today we have Kyle Rogers. He's the director of athletic performance at CSU Northridge. Um, so we're actually in the weight room at Northridge now. Um, so welcome, Kyle. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, so we're uh, down in LA right now, kind of made the, the trip down to record a few podcasts. Um, and this is our first stop on the, uh, the tour. And I think a good way to kind of introduce it would be like where our relationship started. Um, so I think we've known each other, it's like two years now, yeah, right? Yeah, probably, yeah. And we've uh, had some awesome conversations along the way, you know, hopped on the phone multiple times and we've kind of, you know, chopped it up about performance, but just a ton of other stuff. And it's always been a great conversation. So right when we started this podcast, it was like one of the first people I thought of was, I want to get Kyle on this podcast because, you know, the conversations, I remember we had probably the second one. We're like, man, we should have recorded that. (laughs) That was like a podcast. Every time we talk, I'm like, man, people will probably pay to listen to this shit. Yeah. Or just be like, God, these guys need to get a life. Yeah, seriously. No, but they've always been great. So um, I think uh, where we want to go with this podcast a lot of the times is just to allow people to tell their story and kind of, you know, how they got to the situation you are. Obviously, you know, with your background, you've been in some incredible positions and gotten to work with some awesome athletes. Um, So I really want you to kind of just tell us a little bit about, you know, your childhood, where you're from, and then how that kind of transitioned into what you do now. Yeah, so I grew up uh, about 30 minutes south of Seattle, Auburn, Washington. Uh, I, I played multiple sports up until like late middle school, early high school, um, until I just started playing baseball. Basically, uh, I peaked early, yes. um, you know, big, big 11, 12 year old all star guy. <laughs> um, A legend. But, uh, you know, it, it sucks, too, because I was always like I was always the biggest kid on the team. I was like from age like 12 to like. 15 I was like mm-hmm. biggest kid on the team best kid on the team and then I stopped and everybody else just kept going just watched them grow um, but uh, yeah so I played baseball all through high school um, went to college uh, actually my senior year of high school I, um, I, I became a pitcher only mm-hmm. and basically the fall before my senior year we went and played a bunch of like junior college teams and that was when I kind of knew like this hitting things really hard. I think I'm just going to pitch. Um, you know, I remember standing in the box and just like go get like, couldn't wait for the at bat to be over. (laughs) Like couldn't wait. And then I was like, ah, you know, I think I'm going to be done with this. I think I'm just going to pitch. Yeah. Um, so went to college and by the time I got to college, I was like the epitome of like the guy who like doesn't throw hard, but knows how to pitch. Mm -hmm. And I hate saying that because like now working in like college athletics and being a driveline working in like player development like you just you make fun of the guys who say that but mm-hmm. like that's truly who I was um, and so that's kind of where I found the weight room um, you know and it was kind of like I knew the weight room was like a means to um, like performance yeah. I, I, you know I just I did what what I read I thought was right you know like I, I ran all the time I, I, I tried to squat the house um, probably stayed away from too much upper body stuff mm. uh, bench to 90 degrees you know that all that good stuff but um, you know it was like through trying to throw harder because I was this guy who like didn't maybe get the opportunities I wanted because I didn't throw hard that was where I kind of developed my work ethic in the weight room yeah. was like just like this endless pursuit to try and figure out how to throw harder yeah um, but anyway so went to junior college um, Got redshirted my first year. Actually had a really good fall, but um, again, just coaches weren't real big fans because I, I didn't throw hard. So redshirted, following year, uh, I transferred to Green River Community College, um, played for Tanner Swanson and Billy Boyer, who are now in pro ball. Tanner Swanson's with the Yankees and, and Billy Boyer's with the Twins. Um, and those two guys like took a huge chance on me, but uh, basically, when I transferred in, I threw a bullpen, and they were like, "Hey, um, you know, have you ever tried to do anything different, or, or throw sidearm or anything?" And and I was like, 
uh, no, but you know, I know what that means. Um, you know, I know that this is my last chance. If I don't do this, I'm, I'm not gonna play baseball anymore. So mm-hmm. uh, I learned how to throw sidearm. And they basically told me like, hey, like there's, we have like six or seven guys who are just like you, like low 80s, over the top, generic righty. Um, you know, so you want to try something different. So I did it, ended up being like the go-to guy, had like two really good years, went from a guy who, um, you know, basically got cut or like pushed out of another another school and uh, took my last chance to be and was one of the dudes and mm-hmm. then got an opportunity to go out and play in four year. Um, so then I went to Belmont Abbey, uh, which is in North Carolina, Division II school, um, led my team in appearances two years there. So ended up having four pretty good years of college. Yeah. Um, but as far as like the academics and stuff went like I just wanted to play baseball, so I didn't I didn't look to see what they had or anything like that. So I have kind of a unique background or a unique path, I guess, to strength and conditioning. I got my degree in sport management. Yeah. I don't have a kinesiology or exercise science background, um, but uh, you know I, I I just fell in love with with strength and conditioning, and I guess that's where you know I, I started getting interested in it. Yeah, I think well, my perception a lot of times was, I guess everybody kind of expects when you see somebody successful you're like they knew exactly what they wanted to do young you know and you meet so many people in the strength and conditioning field who had no idea they were going to go into strength and conditioning like I went into school as a graphic design major you thought you wanted to do physical therapy you were probably a little bit more like him Aaron where you just wanted to play baseball and you didn't really care what you studied but then I think what I hear from your story is like you saw what it could do for you strength and conditioning Mm -hmm. so was it kind of figuring out what it allowed you to do and how it made you successful as a baseball player and how it affected you just as a person that kind of pushed you into strength and conditioning? Yeah, well, I guess when I graduated, I had this degree in sport management mm-hmm. and I just knew that I wanted to do something with sports. Yeah. And so I ended up having two part-time jobs and one of them was working in a working in the athletic department at Green River Community College doing basically like sports information it was like basically a made-up role that the athletic director just gave me because he liked me there you go but it was like sports information and then just like basically all the stuff he didn't want to do like all the all the paperwork stuff he didn't want to do and then another part-time job where I like uh, went to the facility that I trained out of uh, as a high schooler and started coaching athletes started Mm -hmm. you know whether it was pitching whether it was strength and conditioning I started coaching athletes and after about, I guess after, you know, a full school year of doing that, um, you know, and then I kind of made the decision, of, you know, I knew I wanted to go one of those two paths. And it was like, all right, do I want to find like a sports information role at like a, you know, four year or do I want to like, do I want to train athletes? And mm-hmm. I think just the fulfillment of like working with athletes who have gone through or who are going through stuff that I've already gone through mm-hmm. um, and like, getting to be a part of like the process of helping athletes get recruited to go play college. Um, and and then, uh, you know, doing that and, and, you know, having that feeling of helping those guys was when I really knew that I wanted to, wanted to coach athletes to to some capacity. Yeah. And then, so from there, how did you kind of, how did it transition into you being full time in strength and conditioning? Where did that come? Yeah. So I, Became full time at the, the place called Diamond Sports Training Center in um, Sumner, Washington, and uh, I basically created this this program that was called Power Training, which was like basically, I guess now looking back, was kind of like a driveline junior. You know, like mm-hmm. we threw plyos, we threw weighted balls, and then you know I I, I trained them in the weight room, um, and so they ended up hiring me full time. And the way that they were able to hire me full time was like, hey, you're gonna you're gonna coach our like marquee 18 year old team, mm-hmm. and then um, you're gonna train our entire they call it the senior program, which is like probably roughly like 16 to 18 teams, mm-hmm. um, ranging from like 14 14 years old to 18 years old. Um, and so I would train those guys during their team practice uh, in the weight room, and then I also had like this program where they could come after school and and do the full program, and so. Um, you know, I started doing that full time and really just started like reading Cressy stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to uh, Tony Gentlecore and Dean Somerset's hip and shoulder workshop. And like that was where I first learned like how to assess an athlete. Yeah. 
And so it was like, all right, this is really cool. Like, I'm going to start assessing my athletes when they start training with me. And then you start, like, developing programs based on that. Um, and then basically, like, that's kind of how I got into driveline. I'm sure we'll get more into that later. But that was kind of how it just started, uh, kind of like a snowball effect. It just kind of started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And, and now what point in time did you kind of make that switch? Like, all right, I need to really start – studying this stuff and perfecting it like learning from the best in the field was that while you were in college or was that once you stopped playing baseball and then you started training um i guess it was partially probably like my senior year of college um was when i started kind of researching you know like what other people did for training for baseball um and then getting into actually training athletes and actually the guy that i worked for at diamond sports had uh, Cressy's like maximum strength handbook, like his like yeah. first book he ever wrote. Um, and so that was kind of like my first introduction to like him and like somebody of his status. Um, and so then it was just like, how do I become more like him? Mm -hmm. And I remember, I think every coach kind of goes through this experience and I think it helps having the foundation of a kinesiology degree, but it's like when you have to step away from that classroom and taking tests and just being lectured to, and you are in front of an athlete or a group of athletes and okay, now it's time to coach. It's like a lot of people feel unprepared for that, right? Where you step from a sports management degree straight into coaching and pretty much what it sounds like running your own program. Like, mm -hmm. did you feel prepared to coach those athletes when you, when the time came to have to actually coach? I mean, at the time I probably thought I was, yeah. but looking, looking back, back, like now looking back, if I were to look at what I did with them, yeah, it's probably like, obviously you know they're they're high school kids you know 14 to 18 like realistically anything you do with them yeah. is going to work some um but probably not no i mean but i think i think that's what's helped me be the coach that i am because mm -hmm. you had to i had to learn on the fly yeah. i had to i had to figure it out and you know i think i think that is one of the issues with the guys who are fresh out of school is they don't have that that hands-on experience yeah um you know like we'll have interns come here who you know are fresh out of our our master's program or fresh out of our undergrad and and like their their knowledge and their intelligence is unbelievable but when it time when it gets time to go on the floor they don't know how to interact with athletes yeah or they spend 10 minutes with the same athlete trying to teach them how to do something very mm -hmm. simple and it's like you know like give them a cue or two and move on, you know, work, work to the next guy. And I think that those are things that you develop over experience. Um, and I think that I've kind of used it as maybe like a little bit of like a chip on my shoulder of like, I don't have that, that education background, um, of a kinesiology degree or an exercise science degree, but, but I have worked with a lot of athletes mm -hmm. and I've, I've, I've done different things and seen different results and that's helped yeah. shape my, my philosophy. And I think, in my opinion, a good way to kind of segue into the next chapter of your life, which would be driveline baseball, is if you look at the background of driveline baseball, the creator, Kyle Bodie, it's not like he had a baseball background. Like, he just learned through implementation and learned through testing and, and trial and error. Um, so actually kind of, I guess that's a good way to kind of segue into what was driveline experience like for you? What did you learn out of that? And um, I guess kind of obviously they're known for their environment. So if you can kind of touch on that as well. Yeah, um, I think, and the, the perception of driveline, I think is, is... I guess for anyone who doesn't know driveline, we, we should probably describe driveline. And I think you could probably do it better than anybody. Yeah, so driveline is, um, I guess, you know, their, their, their slogan, I guess, is they're, they're data-driven. Um, mm -hmm. And what's funny is, is when I worked at, at Diamond Sports, I actually... Um, I, I started to like despise driveline. I thought what they were doing was so dumb. And, um, you know, they're, so they're, they're a baseball training facility located again, just South of Seattle. Um, I guess Trevor Bauer is like their, like their poster child. Um, him and him and Kyle Bodie formed a relationship years ago. And, um, you know, there's been a number, number of, of professionals, minor league, major leagues that have trained there. Um, but you know they're they're kind of known for pushing the envelope, mm -hmm. um, which I guess is what I thought was the most cool thing about working for them at the very beginning was like, 
and they kind of pride themselves on pushing the envelope. You know, they didn't want to conform to the way that other people did them. Um, you know, they wanted to they wanted to try and find the best way to do things, not mm-hmm. just what has worked already. Yeah. Um, so you know, they've they've obviously grown a ton. They have uh, you know full biomechanics lab now. Um, they're getting force plates, or they have force plates, but they're getting more force plates for when they move to their new facility. And, and so, um, you know, they're kind of the, the information or, or data capital of, of baseball right now and, and player development, really. And they're kind of shaping the way that a lot of organizations are starting to, to attack player development. Um, but I guess the, the way that I got there was um, I trained a guy at Diamond Sports, Brandon Mann, who was like a, a lifetime minor leaguer, like mm-hmm. played in the minor leagues for like 14 years, went to Japan, played in the big leagues in Japan, came back, played in the minor leagues, played indie ball, and then finally made it to the big leagues at like age 34. Awesome. Um, but I, I just ran into him, actually, I was at the gym working out and I, I overheard him talking to somebody else and went up and introduced myself. And I was like, D- do you play baseball? And he's like, oh yeah, I'm in, the, I'm in the Pirates organization. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like you should come check out check out my, uh, my my stuff I got going on at Diamond Sports. So I am training him for like two off seasons. And then the next off season, he needed to throw a bullpen. And uh, Alex Berg was his friend who would catch all of his bullpens. Alex Berg was another minor leaguer, uh, now works in player development for the Rangers. And Alex Berg was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to driveline. I catch a bunch of bullpens there. So he went to driveline and just like fell in love with it. Because yeah. I think kind of getting back to the environment is like, you have all these guys who are, I guess, in theory, competing against each other, mm-hmm. but they're all competing for the, they're all working for the same goal, and that's mm-hmm. to make the major leagues or, you know, work up the farm system or whatever it might be. Um, but they're all, you know, it becomes like a brotherhood where they're all like working together to accomplish this thing, even though they're all working against each other, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you'll, you'll walk in and there will be uh, high schoolers uh, there will be college guys, there will be minor leaguers, there will be big leaguers on any given day. And you see, you know, big league veterans in there talking with high schoolers about pitch grips. Mm-hmm. And, like, they just, you know, they just talk to each other like that. Um, and so I think that's part of the reason that Brandon fell in love with it. And then once he fell in love with it, he was like, hey, man, like, you got it. You got to come over here. Like, mm-hmm. this place is awesome. Like, you're going to grow so much when you come here. And so... I was like, ah, yeah, I don't know. Like, I was still kind of on the fence about still driveline. Hated them. Yeah, <laughs> like, it just, like, because they're so, like, it, they used to always say, like, driveline baseball, we're better than you and we know it. Like, that was, like, the <laughs> perception of driveline baseball. Uh, and so, like, it, you just, like, you didn't like them for that reason. Mm-hmm. But, and I think that they all kind of have, all the employees there and all the people who train there, really, too, like, all kind of have that like chip on their shoulder too of like and like we were rejected you Mm -hmm. know like we we didn't play baseball at a high level or we didn't get recruited by by you know big schools like rob hill for example um you know played at an nai school um you know like really what was funny was that i don't consider myself to have like a great baseball like i didn't have a great baseball career like i i played four years of college baseball and i'm grateful for that Mm -hmm. But, like, there was a while there where, like, I was, like, aside from one person, I had played the highest level of baseball as all of the trainers. We had uh, Matt Daniels, who played Division One baseball, um, and then everybody else was, like, either, like, NAIA or, like, didn't play baseball. Yeah. Um, so I think they kind of carry that same chip on their shoulder of, like, you know, like, we didn't play baseball at a high level or we weren't, you know, we didn't throw, we didn't throw 100, but we're the ones helping people figure out how to do it. Yeah. You know, you don't need to have that background to, to know how to coach someone to do it. Yeah. And now Rob Hill's with the Dodgers. Yeah. So Rob, you know, played junior college baseball, played at Westmont College, NAIA in, in Santa Barbara, and now he's a pitching coordinator for the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. Um, Kyle Bodie, uh, I think, played briefly at a Division three school, and now he's the uh, director of pitching initiatives for the Reds. Mm-hmm. Um, it's yeah. definitely a new age of baseball. Yeah. Eric Jaggers, um, you know, while he did – go to Iowa for a fall, never played a season at Iowa. So his highest level, I guess, of competition would be junior college. Granted, the dude could still probably throw 97 right now from the left side, but 
Um, you know, but now he's assistant pitching coordinator for the Reds. Yeah. Uh, Sam Breen, another one, played Division Three baseball, played in the Pecos League, uh, director of pitching for the New York Yankees. So, yeah, like, that's awesome. These guys are just they're they're changing the game. Yeah, that's incredible. It's awesome to hear all those stories. Yeah, but it's I guess one thing that because there was such a wide range of athletes, right? Like you talked about from high schoolers all the way up to big leaguers. It's, and we've had this conversation too. It's like, what makes the outliers different? Like the guys that do make it. And so in your opinion, seeing all the athletes that came through driveline, like what stood out to you about the people who do make it to the next level, even if it's not getting to the bigs, but it's a kid who came in throwing 78, you know what I mean? And, and made a career for himself just by working hard. Like, what do you think is the difference between that and someone who didn't? Yeah, I think it's tough because I think there's there's multiple types of outliers. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's like Eric Jaggers, for example, like he was a little like, I guess, for lack of a better term, like psychotic in the way that he approached training. Mm-hmm. You know, like he needed to find like that that dark, like that dark space to like go train. Yeah. You know, to find that like heavy like, metal. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, that's Bauer. Bauer's the heavy metal guy. He'll yeah. put heavy metal on, which is just interesting because he doesn't like, I don't think he approaches it with like a, that same psychotic type of, of like energy. But, but like, if you watch Eric Jaeger's train, just like the way that he approached it was so unbelievable. But then on the very flip side of that, you have like a guy like Casey Weathers mm-hmm. who like, just was very consistent in the way that he approached things. You know, like he did his program to a T, no more, no less. And like he obviously, like he saw results, you know, maybe he didn't get the, you know, major league contract he was looking for, the career that he maybe envisioned for himself, but you know, he had success training, um, was able to come back and pitch healthy and, and uh, achieve that. But like the way that he approached it and he held himself to such a high standard, mm-hmm. Um, to this day, probably one of the most impressive guys that I've watched in the weight room. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, like, if his technique was off like a millimeter, he wasn't happy with it. Yeah. Um, so he just held himself to such a high standard. But I think, like, the way that, that Jaggers trained, too, like, there was a high standard there, too, but they just both went about it so differently. Yeah. Um, and I think that where some people go wrong is they'll try and like force one of those two yeah, paths. Yeah, try to be somebody else. Yeah, they'll, they'll try to force that that method on themselves. And it's like, hey man, like you're not a guy who like, uh, we had a guy come in, um, you know, and if you just watch like the Instagram or the Twitter and stuff like that, you see the run and gun pull downs, the guys grunting and stuff like that. And we had a guy come in and, and do his pull downs and, and grunt before he threw the ball. So it was like not even like timed up properly. And that's when, you know, it's like, Hey, that's fake energy. Like, yeah, you know, you're not giving it your all. You're just pretending to give it your all. That's interesting. Yeah. So I bet. And it's like, they have this following, you know, like people want to be associated with driveline baseball. I mean, I can remember summers working there and you'd have a guy come assess and the day after he assesses would throw in his Twitter profile uh, driveline baseball and it's like come That's on crazy or or you come assess and then you walk over to the business office and you buy a bunch of the, the merchandise and it's like you don't even know if you like it here yet yeah you might lose five miles per hour we don't know <laughs> coaching awesome. like coaching all of those different types of personalities and things at the same time in such a tight environment how did you kind of handle the differences of each athlete um and like what kind of different coaching styles did you have to use on the floor to kind of merge everyone together in the same? Yeah, I guess you kind of have to learn like what makes different people tick. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like, and a lot of it is just like figuring out personalities, you know, like some guys, some guys will have a bad, like bad training day. Like obviously we'll call it velo days, you know, and they're like, they live and die on every PR. Yeah. Um, and some guys after a bad velo day will just like shut down. And so you have to figure out which ones you have to like talk to and like pat them on the back a little bit. You have to figure out which ones you just let them do their thing. And, and because some of them will use it as like a fuel to like fire their, their lift. You know, let's say they got a you know, pull down session and then they lift. 
you know, some guys will use that poor performance mm -hmm. in the weight room and like get after it in the weight room where some guys are just, you can tell it's just like lingering over their head that they just had a bad day and it's just like, they're like sluggish around the weight room. And so I think just that, just figuring out how they tick and, and mm -hmm. figuring out how to, how to approach those situations um, from a personality standpoint, I guess. Yeah. I just had actually a great conversation with one of my mentors, Greg Robbins, and um, we were talking about kind of the assessment process or even just like the first conversation you have with an athlete, right? And he was telling me, you know, we all ask athletes like, okay, why are you here, mm -hmm. right? And immediately a 15-year-old kid's going to be like, I want to be better at baseball, right? right? But if you ask them a follow-up question to that, why? What will that do for you, to, for you to be a better baseball player? And like a kid has never really thought about that. No. Why do I want to be a better baseball player? Like, and when you get to that underlying cause, and I think you're going to have to ask multiple questions, especially with younger kids, because they've never thought on that level, like, why do I feel the need to be a better baseball player? Like, what, what is driving that? But when you get to that why, like the true why, because everybody wants to be a better baseball player, but what does that mean to you individually? Right. right? And then once you can kind of uncover that and see what actually is behind the, the curtain there, then I think you have a better chance of motivating that athlete because you actually understand where they're coming from. And I think that's kind of what you touched on is like handling different styles. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, same thing. Like, you know, we would have during our assessment process is like day one is the skill, whether it be, mm -hmm. you know, pitching, going through the pitching stuff or hitting, going through the hitting stuff. Day two would be the strength assessment. Then day three would be like the meeting with the athlete. It's like, all right, we're about to lay out everything you're good at, everything you suck at. But before we get into that, like, like, why are you here? What do you want to accomplish with training here? Mm -hmm. And it's like every time it's like, oh, I want to gain velocity. Or it's like, well, no shit. Like everybody wants to gain velocity. Like, yeah. Or like, oh, I want to be a better pitcher. And it's like, again, no shit. Like yeah. get more specific with me. And, and when you, like you said, when you try to get them to be more specific, they don't, they don't really know. And mm -hmm. a lot of it I think is, it's like a, it's like, it's like what they perceive as, the right thing to do oh everybody's yep. training at driveline or everybody's everybody's doing this for training so i want to do this for training and once you finally figure out like you said you know what what it is they want to do like we had a guy last year um who just had an atrocious year of of minor league ball yeah and um like he even came up to me at the end of the off season and was like did you guys believe me when i said that i played pro ball because he was like so bad early in the off season because he had just been like dominated mentally by the, by the minor league season. And he was a guy that you kind of had to like, if he had a bad day, you kind of had to like pat his back and kind of remind him, you know, why he's here, you know, like you're an early draft pick, um, you know, like you like, you like to play baseball, obviously, um, you know, so let's, let's get through this let's look at the big picture here and and you know realize this is a bump in the road and and here's what we're going to do to get you back on track mm -hmm. um i think periodic like checkpoints of where they are and where they're going are super important yeah um i do that with our guys here a lot at, at csun um you know like if we're you know early on in the fall we were doing uh tempo work mm -hmm. um because my goal was just to like I, before we added like super heavy external load, I needed to trust that their technique was solid. And when you have uh, a group of, you know, 30 guys in the weight room to one coach or two coaches or whatever that may be, um, I like to use tempo stuff for like, you know, neuromuscular, uh, benefit. And so, uh, like week three of it. And, and I even explained to them early on, like, Hey, like, you know, this weight's going to be submaximal. It's not, not super heavy, but just trust me here. We're going to get to the heavy stuff. And it was like a five week block and week three of five, I'm walking around and I just see multiple guys like grinding reps. And I'm like, I like look at the sheet and I think it was even like 70, 75% of one at max. And it's like, all right, that's, that shouldn't be a grinded rep ever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I had to like pull them in and I like literally just drew out on the whiteboard. All right, here's where we are. It is, you know, September 15th. Your first game is February 14th. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have a plan to get you where we're going, but we got to stick to that plan. We can't take any shortcuts or anything like that. We got to stick to it. And so I, I really like periodic checkpoints and, you know, in a few weeks when we start lifting heavy and, and you know, we can check back in and see where we're at, see where we're going. And 
Um, I think that's the good part about having kind of a, a long-term yearly plan and then also knowing that you can steer away from that if, if you are any quicker, any slower to that final destination that you think you might be at. Yeah, I think that's one thing that we try to stress to our athletes is, like, I want you to know why you're doing something in the weight room. I, I don't want you to be kind of clueless as, as to what's going on. And obviously, like, as a coach, you don't want to, like, draw, you know, an exercise physiology course on, right. on the whiteboard like keep it simple for them but I think it's so important and such a missed thing a lot of times with coaches is you know it's let's get in the weight room and just grind right away it's like right. no how about we tell the athletes exactly what's going on because I know myself as an athlete like I would have wanted to know that you know right. I would have wanted to know exactly the reason for for what's going on and I think that's that's really important well, and I, I think it's such a, a crucial thing to learn in life is that when you have this goal that you're working towards, say, let's just say opening up a new business, right? Mm -hmm. You don't just go straight for it, right? You got to accomplish these little goals throughout mm -hmm. your, right. the process, check the boxes, and then work towards that goal. It's, you can't just go right to it because then if you, if you do end up you know, struggling through that, it's going to feel like that end goal is just unattainable. But if you check these small boxes along the way, that's when you feel that accomplishment and you, you work towards your, the, the end goal. Yeah. Right. And then one, one thing that like intrigued me, cause when we, when we met is when I came up to driveline, I was there for five days, right? right. And it was such a crazy environment to walk into, but what intrigued me the most is all the different coaches completely different personality styles right mm -hmm. and it's like so many different types of practitioners all under one roof you know like you guys yeah. have well, it's like I don't know I don't want to call them computer programmers I don't know a better word for it but like your data analysis yeah, guys yeah. right you have those guys you have Rob Hill who's like you know a hired hype man slash psycho. throwing he's coach. a psycho yeah a hired psycho <laughs> and so it's there were so many different personalities, but also so many different expertises under one roof, right? And I think a lot of people make the mistake of, you know, if they want to open up a gym, they hire three strength coaches mm -hmm. who all do the same thing, have the same knowledge, and then they think like that creates success. Right. But a lot of the times it's like, no, hire people from different backgrounds with different expertise, and then that like just kind of see what happens. So did you feel like that was a um, kind of an advantage to being a driveline is having so many different personalities and outlooks and expertise all under one roof in one organization? Yeah, I think the the dynamic of the – I'll start with just, just the, the coaches and trainers because I think that dynamic is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it's a super, like, competitive dynamic. Um, I think mostly because we were all a bunch of 20-something adult men – that knew that like, all right, yeah, we're at driveline now, but you know, what comes after driveline? We mm -hmm. want to be, we want to be the best coach to come out of driveline. Um, and obviously you see now that uh, a lot of us have gotten jobs elsewhere. And so you know that that's a possibility of, you know, whether it be a professional team recruiting you to come work for them or uh, a college program that wants you to work for them. So I think that that I think it worked for us and against us at the same time because mm -hmm. we butt heads sometimes because it was so competitive. But I think it also allowed us to like grow because we knew that like if we didn't take care of our like continuing education or if we didn't put in the right amount of effort with an athlete that there was a possibility that either A, a another coach at driveline would pass us up or B, they would hire somebody who was better than us or mm -hmm. hire somebody that would pass us up eventually. And so it keeps you honest with yourself to like make sure that you're taking care of your business and, and continue to grow yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that dynamic is really interesting, but kind of going back to your point of, of different personalities of, um, you know, the Alex Caravans of the world, the, our quantitative analyst who's one of the more interesting men I've ever met in the world. Um, side, side story, he was a late invite to my wedding and he wore bright yellow cargo shorts. <laughs> And a, and a, and a button-up shirt that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, I, I had somebody come into the, the little room when I was signing my, my marriage license and said, who's the guy in the yellow shorts? He looks like he's going to be trouble. <laughs> but a guy uh, walks into a wedding with yellow cargo shorts and <laughs> start asking questions. <laughs> well, and I didn't know either because obviously when you walk out, you just see like top up. So I didn't even, I didn't even see the yellow shorts. But I immediately was just like, ah, that must be caravan. But yeah, one of the more interesting interesting dudes I've ever met, but also one of like the smartest dudes I've ever met. Um, 
but yeah, I think, and we always looked for that too when we would when we would hire new people. So when we would interview, we actually turned one guy down when we interviewed him for a strength coach job because uh, me and Sam were talking about him, and I was like, yeah, this guy, you know, really great. I feel like a lot of our ideas align. We have a similar background story, and Sam was like, but I think that I think that could be an issue. Mm. I mean, we don't want. We don't want yes men. We want guys who are going to challenge us on our thoughts and ideas and push us to new, better thoughts and ideas. Um, so that's one of the more um, interesting dynamics of Driveline. And, and I think that, um, you know, if you look at their employees now, a lot of their employees um, have trained there mm-hmm. um, and saw different results from different training, uh, similar to, you know, what I talked about with Jaggers and and Casey Weathers, and mm-hmm. um, you know, you look at Casey now, who's who, you know, was at um, was at Optimum Athletics, and yeah. now he's with the Reds, and you know, so he obviously has developed an ability to coach, probably with a similar personality and, and style that he trained with. Um, whereas you have guys like Rob Hill, who are going to coach and train with the the personality and style that he trained with, um, and and both can be successful. Um, I think it's just a matter of of what athlete you're working with. And that's another thing that I think the personalities helped with at Driveline is um, shortly before I left, we started assigning athletes to trainers. So an athlete would come in, we would kind of go through the assessment process, get to know him a little bit, and then we would assign him to a trainer that we thought would help him Hmm. benefit the most. Um, And so the other good thing that does is it gives the athlete somebody to go to. Yeah. And... You know, then if over time, you know, let's say, you know, we're talking about, uh, let's say me and Sam, and, um, you know, I'm, I have a, a, an athlete assigned to me, but he keeps going to Sam and asking Sam questions. Well, we can cross that bridge and be like, you know what, like you've formed a really good relationship with this guy. Why don't you take him and I'll take so and so, or I'll take the new athlete or, or something like that. So going along those lines of coaching, um, so in, in your playing career, like you kind of, I somewhat got cut from your first JUCO and then moved on to the second and then had some some new coaches that you were working with. Would you say that your second half of your college career where you, you know, had some opportunities and did well, was that mostly because of your training or would you say it was because of the coaches that believed in you and gave you opportunity? So I guess that's where I have another unique story. I had five, so I played five years, I guess I was in college for five years and I had five different head coaches. Wow. Um, so obviously transferred after my first year of college. Um, after my first year at Green River for Tanner Swanson and Billy Boyer, um, Swanee got a job at UW, and Boyer ended up going to one of the other junior colleges because he didn't get along with our new coach. Um, and then played my second year at JUCO under a different head coach and transferred to the four-year. Um, after my junior year, at uh, Belmont Abbey, my head coach went to be the pitching coach at Iowa, and then we got a new head coach. So I guess um, I would say uh, probably, uh, I'm gonna go two different ways with this, but I think that playing for all of those different coaches um, helped me coach now because I did get to interact with so many different styles. Mm that it a gave me like i think as a coach you take style from people that you've learned from or coached with um so it it kind of gives you something to to take what you like and and weed out what you don't like and so i had five different guys to take stuff from um but i think yeah i i mean i guess what really propelled my my success as an athlete would be um i'm a guy who kind of I, I succeed when I know people believe in me. So I guess, you know, that first year with Tanner Swanson and Billy Boyer, when those guys really showed like a belief in me, um, you know, was when I kind of took my playing career to that next level. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I always find interesting about strength coaches is like, I think we're all kind of drawn into the field for the same reasons, right? Either it had an effect on us in some way, or it helped us with our playing careers, whatever it might might be, we got into the field because we just love the gym. Like we right. love that environment. But like myself personally, it's like um, 
just within the last like year or two years, it feels like I've found like my mission within strength and conditioning, but it doesn't, it's not like it's my mission is to just get kids stronger and more athletic. Right. You know what I mean? Like I think we find our mission as we kind of get deeper into our career. Is that something that you found where almost strength and conditioning is like a vessel towards another goal or to, towards another thing that you can um, be a positive influence on others? Yeah, I think I think coaching in general because it it just you know, like early on, especially when you start learning things, it's it's all about you feel like you know more than the athlete, and mm-hmm. so like this athlete should listen to me because I know more than him. Um, and then as you gain more experience, it becomes less and less about like the sets and reps or the mm-hmm. the physiological impacts and stuff like that, and more about interacting and, and providing impact. And yeah. I think that's that's really the big thing I'm after is like providing impact, knowing that I've I've made an impact on somebody's life, whether it whether it's personal, you know, whether it's like they feel like they can come talk to me about things or whether I make them a better athlete. You know, like mm-hmm. I think you, I think there's so many avenues to provide impact. And so I think, yeah, I think my mission is just to you know figure out which way I'm going to provide the best impact to each individual and, and, and just feed off that. That's an interesting point. I haven't really thought about it like that, that even though my mission might be one thing, it's like the way that mission impacts every different athlete can be, could be completely different. But it's like for me, like I had a kid text me yesterday um, and it's, you know, he's a great athlete, but it, he's just the kind of kid that gets in his own head like yeah. horribly. Um, but he texts me, he was like, hey, can we meet up on a weekend and just grab some coffee and talk? And to me, I'm like, I'm like, yes, like Correct. immediately. Absolutely. You know, because like, that's the kind of impact I want to make on a, on a kid is like he sees me as a valuable influence or, you know, I guess mentor outside of the weight room. It's like he's, he doesn't, I'm sure he's not going to sit down and ask me like, you know, about concurrent training models, <laughs> you know, like that's not what he cares about, right. but I'm glad that I can provide some value in that way to him. Right. I had, uh, I was just up in Seattle for the holidays, uh, visiting family and stuff. And I, uh, had two kids that, uh, I've trained since they were 16. Mm-hmm. Um, they're now 21 and 22. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. And so I went out, got drinks with them. <laughs> uh, but they're like, they're they're both seniors in, in college now, and um, they're still playing baseball. And mm-hmm. so it's like, it's really cool that we can have this. You know, like they're off living their life, but mm-hmm. you know, it's still you provided that impact to them. And one of them even said to me like. Hey man, like those those two years that I played for you and trained for you were like the most impactful years of my life, like yeah. the most beneficial years of my life. Shed a tear. Yeah, right and it's, he's like, yeah, I don't mean to get deep sauce on you, but yeah. uh, he's like six drinks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then I had another uh, another former athlete who is at uh, Montana State Billings, and he wrote like their coaches made them write like gratitude letters. Oh, uh, they had, like great. choose every choose. coach make your kids do that. Yeah. <laughs> choose somebody to write like a letter of gratitude with yeah. and so he chose me and I was like I like I would have never even thought that like he would choose me like I mm-hmm. you know I coached I was coached him for a year um but you know he's like yeah you know I wouldn't I wouldn't even have this opportunity to play college baseball if it wasn't for you and it, so it's like yeah okay you wouldn't have this opportunity to play college baseball but you know that that like, gets deeper than that mm-hmm. you know, like you provided um you know like this you provided this you had this influence on this kid outside of athletics yeah and I guess so kind of going past driveline right like you've kind of taken the next step in your career um and obviously it's a very different environment than what you were in so all the lessons you learned at driveline I'm sure since then since making your move into the college sector there's been some some more things that have kind of um, impacted you or some changes that you've had to make as a coach so kind of describe what that transition was like and maybe like the most impactful lesson you've learned since then yeah I think uh, there's obviously there's obviously very big differences from private sector to to college in general but I think going from a place like driveline to such college, a special just, place yeah like it, it it's so much different because for, for starters I was so much more involved on the skill side mm-hmm. um, at driveline and I think um, you know while that is something that is interesting to me it's not something that is part of my like job requirements here or, like mm-hmm. it's not it's not part of my responsibilities um, and the other thing is you have so many more athletes that you're in charge of um, you know, like I don't have just a baseball team you know I have 
I have baseball and, and softball and, and volleyball, and then I have, you know, I literally oversee every team. So, um, you know, there's so many more athletes to work with. Um, but I think, I guess as far as, um, you know, lessons that I've learned, um, I guess a, another big difference is that, you know, at Driveline people are obviously choosing to come train with you. Mm-hmm. You know, here they have to train with me. Um, so I guess there's a little bit more, there's a little bit more to having to get people to buy in. Um, Mm -hmm. but I guess, you know, especially being somewhere like, uh, Cal State Northridge where like not very many of our athletes are going to go off and play professional baseball. It becomes so much more about the individual and the relationships and so much less about the performance. Um, so I guess, you know, that's valuable experience to gain, um, is, is interacting with those people on a regular basis. Yeah. And I'm sure it's, um, you know, at driveline, there's a very specific kind of person that goes to train there. Right. Right. Where, you know, some like someone on your women's soccer team is not going to have that same drive. It, it, they may, I'm not saying they don't have high drive, <laughs> right. but their, their motivators are going to be much different. Right. So like, what have you learned about kind of motivating those, those different individuals or at least interacting with people who have different motivators? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like you said, like people at driveline, a lot of it is like minor leaguers who are on like their like final, final mm-hmm. chance, you know, like if they yeah. don't, if they don't increase velocity on their fastball, like their career is over. Yeah. Um, whereas like soccer, uh, I guess I won't use, I won't even use soccer. I'll just say like the athletes here in general, like, you know, whether they gain five miles per hour or whether they even play after college is, it's really like, uh, you know, not a big deal to them, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, you know, I guess motivating them is, is um, you know just using it as as valuable experience to learn work ethic, yeah. um, you know, and, and and create standards for yourself. Um, you know, I think we hold athletes to very high standards as far as um, you know the way they approach their training and and the way that they execute their lifts. Um, so you know, like when we test, it's not it's not about you know how much weight you can get off the floor and say, well, I, I got it up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's about how much weight you can perform with perfect technique or, you know, whatever that, you know, wherever you're at in that process. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that there are lots of things that you can develop through holding yourself to those standards and and coming in and working hard and, um, that will pay off in other areas of life. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like we said about, you know, using strength and conditioning as a vessel to teach other things, right. Teach other kind of values. (laughs) Um, so one thing I think, like you, especially because you made the transition from driveline, but also you've seen so many other people make that transition from that career to another step in their career. And, you know, that's a huge decision to make. Mm-hmm. So for anyone who's kind of stepping into a new career, or just making a change in life, like how do you, how did you evaluate that, um, that opportunity? How did you kind of take that process? And, and what was that like kind of making that large of a change? I mean, moving from Washington to Southern California, um, obviously, you know, moving from where you had family right. to, you don't really know anybody in the area. Like that's a, that's a massive change. So what was your thought process going through that? Um, I think it's about figuring out, I guess, kind of how you perceive success. Mm. Um, so I, I, I keep going back to this word impact, but I think it has a lot to do with that. And I think that, um, you know, speaking for, a lot of the other guys at driveline who've taken other jobs and then for myself who's taken another job is is you you want to leave your print on something mm-hmm. um you know so like i know that those guys wouldn't accept jobs in pro ball unless they knew that they would be able to have freedom and the ability to to do things the way that they want to do them and mm-hmm. provide the impact that they know they can provide um so i guess kind of coming to the decision to come here was like um you know we had uh, Bob Alejo just took the, the job um, as an administrator and, um, you know, they kind of cleaned house a little bit in strength and conditioning, hired the grad assistant as a full-time employee and then hired me as the director. And so it kind of presented itself as an opportunity to kind of take something from ground zero and build it up mm-hmm. the way that I wanted to build it. Um, and so I think, again, kind of going back to that word impact is like, you know, can I, you reach a point, I think with any, with anything in life or any job that you have where you kind of reach a point where you're like, all right, like 
you know, I've given everything I can give to this place and they've given me everything they can give back to me. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I take these experiences from here and help build something else up where using somewhere else, build something else up somewhere else, Mm -hmm. um, you know, where I can use these same principles and ideas that I've developed over the years and, and kind of, you know, like I said, leave my print. And then building something from ground zero. Well, when you were coming in here, what was kind of your mindset as far as like what you wanted to accomplish first? Was it first like working on building relationships? Was it getting organized in here? What was like your, your kind of priority list when you were coming in? Yeah, it was tough. And I, I guess I would say that I'm still kind of uh, a little bit trying to figure that out um, mm-hmm. because I guess, you know, coming in here, I had never been, you know, I played division two baseball. We didn't have a strength coach. We had a weight room that was open to everybody. Um, and then our weight room was so bad that they gave every athlete a free membership to the Y down the street. So wow. like, you know, it, like strength and conditioning was not a thing um, at, at any school that I played at with junior college or, or, um, or Belmont Abbey. And so, um, you know, I didn't really even know what strength and conditioning was like at the college level at all. I didn't really have any expectations. Uh, I, uh, I would even like get a little bit intimidated when I would think about it because it was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be like the first day that we have athletes come in and train. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you start to learn, you know, on the go when they come in and train, that it's like, Oh, you know, they're just, I know how to train athletes. Mm-hmm. It's easy, you know, like, um, so I guess, you know, kind of going back, like, yeah, building relationships is important. I think building relationships with the athletes and, and, and building relationships with the coaches as well. And, um, you know, that's one thing that Bob has really been trying to, um, get me to improve on is, is like, you know, you don't have to necessarily, when, when the athletes come in, you don't necessarily have to coach them. You know, like if, let's say, for example, my assistant's uh, one of his teams in training, and so, you know, obviously I want to let him do his thing and run the floor and coach his team. Um, and so Bob has, has stressed to me, like, you, you, don't have to, you don't have to necessarily go up and down the, the floor and coach them. You can go up to them and, and say, you know, let's say it's a women's basketball team, you know, like, Hey, you know, how'd the game go last night? How many points you score? How many minutes you play? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ask those types of questions, the questions unrelated to maybe what you're actually doing in here that lets them know that you care about them outside of the weight room as well. And, and, and uh, I think that goes a long way in creating those relationships. Yeah, I think that's one thing that's, I don't know if it's undervalued, but I don't think coaches take advantage of it enough is just letting athletes know they care, you know? And it's like, I make it a point um, now. It's like when we're going through our, our warm up, like groundwork, I go and I, I shake a kid's hand and like, I'll, I won't let go of their hand until they look me in the eye and like return. I say, you know, hey, how's your day? How are you, how are you doing? Yeah. And if they just say good and like try to return their stretch and I just grab the hand and just hold it until they like ask me and we have a conversation about it. And it's like, I, I make it a habit too. of I ask pretty much every single kid, even our adults, what was the best part of your day? Right? Like, Let's focus on some positive things, but also like I want to, I want you to know that I care about you past sets and reps. Because at, at the end of the day, like yes, I'm a strength coach. People probably just think we're meatheads a lot of the time, but like we said, like I want to make an impact past that. I want to provide some value past that. And so I think that's really important for coaches to kind of understand that um, you know let athletes know you care, or else they're probably not going to be all that concerned with what your, uh, you know, your rep schemes are. Well, that's the thing too, is the athletes can tell, like they know, mm-hmm. they yeah. know if, if you, if you care, if you care about them or you care about, um, you know, your, your initiative or, or mm-hmm. you know, your, you want to push your agenda. Um, and I think, um, obviously being from Seattle, big Seahawks fan, but I think you see this a lot with Pete Carroll, you know, mm-hmm. you watch, you watch, uh, you know, when they have like the pregame on the TV and they're in their stretching lines and you see him bouncing around from person to person and and interacting with them. And, and I think that that you you even hear from the players in the league that, you know, the players like to play there and the players enjoy playing for him because Mm -hmm. of that, that reason that he, he cares about them as individuals before athletes. Mm -hmm. And so one, uh, I'm kind of going to put you on the spot here, but I, and I think it's, it's, it's a tough question. I think it's like, tough to um, verbalize but it's one thing that someone actually I'm reading a book right now kind of posed the question and it's when your career is over oh God. when you retire how will you know that you made the impact that you desired right like w- 
what is a way that you will know that your goals were attained when you when it comes time to retire? Do strength coaches retire? Is that a thing? <laughs> I mean, hopefully, yeah. That's actually it's you don't hear about many people retiring as strength coaches. But I, Bob Alejo, legend in the game, he's. Uh, I mean, how long has his career been going now? He's he was with the A's yeah, like in yeah he. Uh, like 10 years at the A's, I think, mm-hmm. or he had 10 years at UCLA, a few years with the A's, went to the Yankees with uh, Giambi, mm-hmm. um, then went to Santa Barbara, mm-hmm. back to the A's, and then NC State, now he's here at uh, beautiful Ooh. CSUN. Yeah. But yeah, he's, he's, good. He's, like, he's 63, just turned 63 not too long ago, still not retired. I'm going to have to ask him the he question could, after this. He could, uh, I think he could retire though, mm-hmm. I think he could. But I guess I'll get back to the question. Um, yeah, it's tough because I, I feel like there's not a way to answer this without it sounding super cliche. Mm-hmm. Hey, but, cliches are cliche for a reason. But yeah, but I think like obviously, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, individuals and, and um, you know, building relationships and, and things like that. And I think kind of just building off of that is like, you know, staying in contact with people after you've trained them and, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, being a part of their life at, at some, some capacity after you've trained them and um, you know, knowing that uh, people want to be, um, how do I say this? People want to be associated with you still, mm-hmm. even outside, at, of, yeah, right? outside of, outside of just, hey, can you rent me a program? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, so one question I just like to ask anybody, I think it's an awesome question, is um, if you could give yourself um, from another point in your life, advice, when would you give it? And what would that have, what would that advice be? Yeah. Um, I think I would give it, uh, I thought about this one. I think I would give it to myself probably like, I was like late, late college, um, Mm -hmm. or, or early into my, my career, I guess, of, um, just, uh, I guess this is kind of twofold of, of redefining success. Mm-hmm. Um, I think often we compare our success to somebody else's success, um, even though our ambitions, whether it be career or personal life, may be much different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because in in the era of social media, I think we we care a lot about the perception of ourselves from others. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I think that that is a big one. Um, you know, I, I guess I'll even say, to be completely honest, I, I was worried about posting that I had accepted a job at Cal State Northridge mm-hmm. um, on social media because I was worried people would be like, what, that guy's leaving driveline baseball to go to a mid-major? Mm-hmm. But then you post it and you get this like outpouring of support because you realize these people that you've you know, built relationships with are happy for you because you made a decision that you view as successful. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's the same as, um, you know, my friends and coworkers at driveline going to pro ball is, you know, then the thought creeps into my head of, do I want to go to pro ball? Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's, I don't think that's my, that's not my career ambition is not to, to be in pro ball. And, and so I think, just redefining success or maybe just refocusing success to be based off of what I view successful to me. Mm -hmm. And then last one, if you could prescribe one habit to the world, what would it be? Yeah, this one I'm going to go with, uh, consistency. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I like to think of Casey Weathers quote of excellence is mundane. Um, it's really, really easy to work hard or it's really, really easy to do things the right way when, when things are going well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, but when you approach life with a consistency or you approach work or, or athletics or whatever you're approaching, uh, approach it with consistency and, and know that, uh, you know, you can still put in a good effort and still do things the right way. Even if, if, if you're having a bad day, or you don't feel a hundred percent. Awesome. You guys got anything else? Any, uh, follow up questions? Yeah awesome episode yeah so um wanted to thank you allow you to kind of um you know where can people find you i know you're super active on twitter um so if people want to follow you where can they find you yeah i'm uh, on twitter uh at kyle rogers 18 one eight and then instagram at kl rogers 28 if you want to argue about bench press or yeah bench press i am uh i'm the bench press guy on twitter apparently <laughs> 
the uh, baseball bench press yeah, guy. Baseball. Apparently, uh, apparently there are people out there who uh, think the bench press is evil. So I'm just here to say it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Lock those scaps, baby. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time.